All right. So today, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about bioinformatics. Um, and part of the reason I'm here is that this is a huge field. And not only do I want you to learn about bioinformatics and, you know, kind of supplement your statistics, but I'm actually kind of recruiting that I think bioengineering people are, would be some of the best bioinformaticians out there. And so I'm kind of increasing my involvement with the department. And so for those that, you know, if you listen to the talk and you think this is maybe something you might want to do, uh, please contact me. So today, basically, first off, I'm going to explain what is bioinformatics. Um, I think that's, that's pretty key here. Um, what is all, and then once I do that, where does all this information that we analyze come from? You know, what are, the, what are the sources of this? You know, once we have the information, how do we know two things that are different? And obviously, statistics is, plays a huge role in that, right? You know, it's basically a way for us to take certain data sets and determine what's, what's different. Um, also, not only do we want to know what's different, but what's connected. That when I analyze, say, so a lot of my talk today, I'm going to talk about cancer because I work a lot on cancer. I guess the question would be, you know, when we come up with these genes that are different between, say, an aggressive versus a non-aggressive tumor, what does it all mean? That you could potentially get thousands of genes that are different between these two different states of cancer. How do we know what's working together, what's working in a pathway, what's what's working against each other. And then hopefully, at, at, if time allows, I'm going to talk about, you know, how do we apply this to an actual research project. And again, if, if we have time, I'm going to talk about some of the, my bioinformatic analysis of the development of lung tumors, which is actually important because um, the, the five-year survival on lung tumors is just incredibly low. You know, how can we use bioinformatics to determine who we should watch out for and who maybe we shouldn't. Okay, so the first question is, what is bioinformatics? Does anybody know what bioinformatics is? Show of hands. Anybody heard of bioinformatics a little bit? All right, cool. Well, you've probably heard, you know, it involves blast searching and all this stuff. I mean, that's part of it. It's a huge, huge field. Um, and as you can imagine it, you know, it's kind of a, a mesh of a lot of different fields, right? You have mathematics, you have statistics, and you have computers. And you also, obviously, this all has to work together to inform the biology, right? My definition of bioinformatics, and I get this from, uh, I have two little daughters, or, uh, well, actually, they're not so little anymore, seven and 12. But we'd, we'd go out to eat, and they'd always give you those placemats for the kids, right? And they'd always have that picture that, you know, what's different between these two pictures? And that's basically what bioinformatics is, is that I'm kind of looking at things that look pretty much the same. What is actually different? And in its truest sense, it is pattern recognition. What pattern is in this condition that is not in this condition? The reality is, is that we have been able, through computers, through DNA sequencing, through basically some of these methods that I'm going to tell you about today, we're able to measure just countless things about any biological entity, right? We have measured so much stuff that your average scientist doesn't know what to do with this information, right? And so they've kind of developed this specialized field, and that's bioinformatics. And when I started doing this, this wasn't even a term. You know, that wasn't even, I've never taken a class in bioinformatics. Um, I kind of see it as, you know, all this information is pixels, right? that if you look at your average high-definition TV, you know, it has probably around 2 million pixels in it or 2 million colored boxes. When you watch your TV, do you see all those boxes? No. And if you do, you should see a doctor or go work for the government. <laughs> but, you know, we don't see that boxes, but our mind puts that information together. We see pictures. You know, these little boxes can make you cry. They can make you laugh. They can make you do all kinds of stuff, you know. So I actually do this to the high school kids, and, you know, I, I say these things, and I make you do all kinds of stuff, and, you know, horny boys, you know, kind of giggle when I do that. But that's my goal is how do I take all this information and make a picture? How can I take it and put it into a picture that the person that's actually working on, say, a disease can understand, that can inform them, that can show them 
which way they need to take their research, okay? So where does all this information come from? And there is a lot. If you are funded by a federal grant, you have to make your data available to everybody. And so people have just been, you know, stockpiling all this data. There is so much data out there that if science stopped tomorrow, that we didn't grow any more cells or kill any more rodents, <laughs> there would be enough information for me for three careers. That it, and it's just, it just keeps coming. It's almost like a, a huge waterfall, right? So, so what are we measuring? Where are we getting this information? Well, for the longest time, there's been this central dogma of biology, right? And this, this is held for, you know, say the last 40 years, or at least, you know, until recently, is that basically you have, in each one of your cells, you have DNA. Am I on here? Okay, yeah. So in each one of your cells, you have DNA, right? And this DNA is made up of approximately 6 billion nucleotides. Again, we can measure all that. These... This DNA has genes in it. And basically, our, the genes that we measure, there's approximately about 25,000 genes. These genes produce messenger RNA. Again, we can measure this as well. This messenger RNA then goes to create proteins. That's how your DNA in your cells does anything, right? You know, they always say, you know, the nucleus is the brains of the cell. But it's the brains because it sends kind of emails out to your cytoplasm to your ribosomes to make proteins. It's, that's like the factories. And again, proteins are completely numerous. We've got 500, you know, just in its purest state, we have about 500,000 uh, proteins that we know of from humans. Just with this information, this would seem overwhelming. This is a ton of information, but we've, we've actually found more things that we can measure, right? Who's heard of microRNAs? Yay. <laughs> I love presenting in college class because when I do the high school, people are like, what? <laughs> what is microRNA? So these short little pieces of mRNA, and they can bind to this mRNA, or microRNAs that bind to this mRNA, and it could cause its destruction. So this is another thing we can measure, and there's a, a little over 800 of those. Not only that, but even the RNA, the thing that we thought was really solid, can be spliced in many, many different isoforms. Currently, I'm working on a gene that has 14 different isoforms, 14 different versions of the same gene expression. Again, we can measure all this. Proteins, now this is a mess, and this is why I work mostly in mRNAs, is that you can do all kinds of things to proteins, right? You can phosphorylate them, you can ubiquitate them, you can do all kinds of, of chemical alterations to them that will, will alter its activity. Right? Again, we can measure all this as well. Let's go back to the DNA. DNA is just not a strand of DNA, you know, uh, a single strand, is that it's, you have to compact it, right? If I took one of your cells and I pulled out the DNA and stretched it longwise, it would probably be as tall as me. And that's just one of your cells. So what happens is your, your DNA has to compress that and to compact it so it'll actually fit in your nucleus. So the way it compacts it has a huge role in what actual genes actually get expressed. Not only that, but then you can methylate it. And we can measure these methylation states as well. So if an area of a DNA gets methylated, it kind of gets shut down. And in fact, these two species here, one's locus, the other one is uh, just your regular grasshopper. One can travel thousands of miles and destroy entire communities by eating all their crops. The other one will jump in your face as you're riding your bike and kind of annoy you. These are genetically exactly identical. The only difference is the way their DNA is compressed. So even you can even have the same amount of DNA, the exact same sequence, it's just which genes get turned on and off will make a huge role in the biological system. And again, we can measure all of this. So you can see how most you know, 60-year-old biologists nowadays are going, oh my God, what am I going to do with all this? So most of my research, and I think the most informative, as far as all those things that you can measure, not only informative, but probably more accurate, is measure, measuring the mRNA, right? 
So again, remember we've got DNA. DNA contains genes. These microRNAs, this microRNA is kind of like the email that the you know, CEO sends out to his workers. Hey, we need more of this. You know, an example of this would be, you know, say you went on a binge drinking, uh, uh, exp you know, last night you, uh, you drank a, a few too many, right? <laughs> you know, you, you won the kickball tournament and so you're all celebrating. Basically, what your DNA is saying is, hey, this guy is trying to kill himself with alcohol. <laughs> we need to produce more alcohol dehydrogenase. So it'll produce more mRNA, right? And this mRNA will go make that enzyme that breaks that down. Again, we can isolate this mRNA. And this will give us an idea of, you know, what's going on in the system. You know, and this is kind of a simplified version of this, is what you can do is you can take this mRNA, you can isolate it, you label it with a fluorescent tag. Then what we do is we hybridize it to these gene chips. And let me get you a couple of those. What I'm going to show you here, what I'm going to pass around here, is basically transform bio biology, biological research. On each one of these chips, we are able to measure the mRNA of every single gene in your cells, and just about every organism as well. As you can see, we can measure everything on there. What's funny is I show this to high school kids, they put their th thumb on it and it's like, it's broken. <laughs> Basically what we do is we mush up the tissue, we isolate the mRNA, we put a fluorescent tag on it, and then we hybridize it to that. A laser will then basically scan that fluorescence, and this is kind of the picture you get. Each one of those pixels represents a, a part of the mRNA. Again, we can measure it. The brighter the fluorescence, the more that gene is turned on, right? If we now have fluorescence, now we can turn this into numbers. And you can see where statistics come into this. We have numbers. We can now characterize things based on those numbers. And given up here are a bunch of different types of uh, tumor types, right? The types and the levels of genes that are on in a particular tissue will distinguish it. And we can use this information if you have the right tools. Okay. Not only that, once you turn it into numbers, and so most of those chips you're looking at will measure about fi over 50,000 different transcripts. We can summarize those transcripts and plot them in three-dimensional space. And I think you're going to... I was talking to your teacher, I think you guys are going to go over this. This is a PCA plot. Who's familiar with PCA plots? No? I love PCA plots. Definitely get familiar with them. I, I love them. It's basically a kind of matrix theory, and from what I've been told, you guys are going to go into that. Lucky you. <laughs> but you can basically summarize all this data three different ways, and then you plot it in three-dimensional space. This is an example of one of these. These are different cell cultures from different parts of your body. So we got epithelial, endothelial, stromal, muscle. You can do this with any tissue type. And what you find is that those samples that are colored the same seem to group together, right? Tissue types seem to express the same genes. Therefore, they're going to be closer in three-dimensional space. Again, you can see here, these tissue types seem to group together. They seem to be more common. And then you got these blue ones down here. These are epithelial cells. They're kind of just following their own thing. But again, you can see how, you know, we can go from basically mRNA, turn it into numbers, and then turn it into three-dimensional graphs. And that's kind of what I like to do is I, you know, I mentioned that TV example is that I think our brains have this innate ability to to understand complex data visually. And so I like stuff like this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of the things, you know, these visual plots that we do to understand the data. So how do you know what's different? 
right? 